Okay, so uh, today let us uh, move to a new topic and this topic will conclude uh, the present MOOCs course and uh, this particular topic uh, is basically based on uh, largely or nearly only on my own research that I have been doing over the last several years. So, in fact, um, it way back in 1997, uh, I published a paper with my PhD guide uh, from University of Illinois where uh, I set out an agenda to express the uh, properties of interacting quantum particles in terms of operators that correspond to particle hole excitations. So, this kind of an idea has a long history and uh, it is only uh, in the mid 90s that people actually figured out how to uh, do it in a way that is practically useful, substantial way. So, in fact, uh, the ideas of uh, Duncan Haldane and others who uh, used his uh, basic ideas of quantizing the Fermi surface. Uh, that was very crucial in uh, many of these developments. So, uh, the work that I did is kind of also pretty much inspired and uh, so to some extent even borrowed from those ideas, but there are some substantial differences. So, I would not be uh, dwelling on the um, real uh, literature on this subject. I mean, uh, to be honest, if I have to be fair to the other authors, I have to spend a lot of time discussing literature survey, what others have done and so on. But uh, that is not the purpose of the present course anyway. It is not to be, I mean, it is not meant to be an honest uh, discussion of uh, what others have done in some chronological order or something. So, it is just meant to you know highlight important topics that students should then uh, make an effort to learn and uh, fill all those gaps namely they should make an effort to uh, see who has done what when and so on and so forth. So, in order for them to do that I have to tell them some resources. So, for example, this paper that I published in Physical Review in 1998, even if you dislike large parts of it, in fact, you, uh, in hindsight, the fermion part of this paper is uh, is rather, I mean, it is ki kind of uh, well motivated, but it is uh, in the end rather incomplete. But uh, the boson part of this paper is quite okay. Uh, but still it motivates this uh, the introduction of these so called non local operators in a very nice way. But uh, the most important uh, positive aspect uh, positive quality of this paper is that it has a large number of uh, very relevant uh, references which uh, normally a reader will be hard pressed to find if it was not uh, uh, you know listed uh, explicitly that way. So, I urge you to uh, read this paper if not for any other reason uh, at least for the references, but I want to convince you that it is worth reading even for the contents. Okay, so, let me uh, start off by explaining what I am talking about. You see the idea is that remember that we have been discussing uh, Hamiltonians uh, we have been describing Hamiltonians of many particle systems in terms of creation and annihilation operators. So, remember that I told you that if you have a system of free uh, fermions uh, moving in space, you can introduce something called the uh, annihilation field operator which is psi bracket r comma t which annihilates uh, a part quantum particle it could be a boson or a fermion at position r at time t. And I also told you that if there are two body interactions between uh, the particles, then the Hamiltonian becomes a quartic. That means that the Hamiltonian will involve two creation and two annihilation operators when you are referring to the term that corresponds to interaction between particles. 
See on the other hand, the kinetic energy term will only involve one creation and one annihilation operator. But now if you sit back and think about it, uh, you will see that you see uh, the, um, the fact that the Hamiltonian consists of these pairs of one creation and one annihilation uh, makes you uh, suspect that it might be possible to uh, give that operator a name. So, instead of calling psi dagger r psi r dash as uh, whatever I just called it namely psi dagger r psi r dash, it is better to give it some kind of a different name. So, what it does is basically it is a particle hole creation operator. So, it kind of uh, it annihilates a particle somewhere and creates a particle somewhere else. So, in other words it creates a particle hole pair, it creates a hole and then it creates a particle. So, that is called a particle hole creation operator. So, it is better to give that a name as some uh, you know B, uh, B dagger or something. So, so let me tell you what, what I mean perhaps. So, uh, okay, let me actually display it then. So, you see uh, if I am talking about uh, see if the underlying particles are bosons, right. So, then your underlying uh, bosons in momentum space will have this property. So, they will have uh, commutation properties. So, uh, B q, q is your uh, usual uh, quant uh, the translationally invariant for a translationally invariant system the good quantum numbers are momenta. So, you have B, B dagger commutator is Kronecker delta and B, B uh, commutator is 0. So, now I am going to define uh, something uh, which is somewhat peculiar, but it is basically a particle hole creation operator. See what this does is it annihilates a boson with momentum h bar q, right. So, q is your wave vector. So, this annihilates a boson specifically a boson okay, uh, with, uh, with momentum and then it creates uh, a boson with momentum 0. Okay, so, you might be wondering why did I define it in this peculiar way and there is a reason for that. But more than uh, just that, you see I am also going to be uh, forced to for reasons I will tell you later, but basically I am going to then multiply this by 1 by square root of n 0, where now n 0 is actually now itself an operator. See this is what makes this subject so difficult because these are what are called non-local operators. So, that you know you have operators that appear in the denominator. I can just give you some uh, simple uh, flavor of what non-local operators can be. See for example, you see if, if I say d y d x. So, this is an operator. So, it takes a see why is this an operator because you can act it on some function and you will get some other. Uh, so, if you fix x it will act on the function and it will produce some number which is basically the derivative. So, d by dx is called an operator for that reason. But then uh, you see if I want to make sense out of this, suppose I want to make sense out of uh, some, uh, some function of d by dx. So, what does this mean? So, this function if it is very simple like whole squared. So, then d by dx whole squared is basically means d by dx then again d by dx that is what this means. So, now uh, if it is whole squared this is uh, perfectly fine cubed it is fine like that, but uh, d by dx to the power 0 is also fine that is same as not doing anything, but what is d by dx to the power minus 1. So, this is where things start to get a little funny. So, this is basically the inverse of the derivative which we know as integration. So, if you have integer powers you can at least make sense out of it this way. So, d by dx whole squared is uh, differentiating twice. 
d by dx whole cube if differentiating 3 times d by dx raised to the power minus 1 is integrating once d by dx raised to the power minus 2 is integrating twice. So, so then you can make sense out of uh, things like you know d by e raised to a d by dx. So, this is perfectly valid because then I can expand this in 1 plus a d by dx plus a square d squared by dx squared by 2 factorial etc. etc. So, this uh, because d by dx makes sense d by dx whole squared is basically d by dx acting twice. So, all of this makes sense and addition makes sense. So, similarly you can uh, write even uh, crazier things like uh, you know you can write uh, uh, sin of uh, uh, you know 1 by uh, whatever yeah, you, you can you can write crazier things like this. Uh, so, if you want to write 1 by sin d by dx that is basically uh, inverse of sin of d by dx. So, you can make a lot of sense whenever Taylor series is possible, but things become even funnier when you ask questions like what is d by dx to the power half, what is square root of d by dx. So, these are what are called non-local operators. So, in, in fact, d by dx to the power minus 1 is already non-local because you see, yeah, okay, let us let, not go there. Bottom line is that this is certainly non-local. Uh, so, because you have to first make sense of this. See, what does this mean? This means this is an operator which has the property that if you act this operator on some function twice, you, it is the same as differentiating it once. So, that is what this operator does. So, so if you call this operator O, so O acting, uh, uh, o acting on f of x means the same as uh, it is that operator when you act twice is same as differentiating it once. So, the question is uh, you might say that like uh, what if uh, I just want to know how it acts once. I mean if it, I know it if it acts twice is same as differentiating it once. So, in order for you to do that uh, I will I will not be able to spend a lot of time explaining but basically you can uh, make sense out of this through Fourier transform. So, you express uh, f of x in terms of uh, some plane waves as a linear combination of plane waves and basically if you do that then d by dx is nothing but uh, it, it gets replaced by i k. So, if, if your basis states is i k x then d by dx is same as multiplying doing d by dx is same as multiplying by i k. So, therefore, uh, doing square root of d by dx is same as multiplying by square root of i k. So, basically your Fourier components gets multiplied by square root of i k and, uh, and then when you uh, do the transform again you will get the meaning of that. Now, you see that that will, uh, so the meaning of that will means that the this operator uh, square root of d by dx acting on f of x will not depend upon f of x only or f dash of x or f double dash of x. Basically, it will depend on all the derivatives of f of x at x. So, basically it is non-local in, in that sense. So, non-local means say, say same as this. Say if, if I take x f of x plus a, this is non-local because the answer for uh, what this is does not depend on how this function behaves close to x equal to a. It depends on how it behaves far away from because a can be anything. So, f of x plus a to know what is f of x plus a it is not enough to know how this behaves close to f of x. That means, you have to know uh, how f of you have to know that function at all points. It is not enough to know what it is close to x. So, as a function of x it is non-local because it depends on how the function is at a point far away from x. So, in fact, you can uh, translate that into this other language I told you about. You can Taylor series this in powers of a and when you do that you will get all derivatives of f of x. So, in other words these two uh, descriptions are equivalent. 
So, saying that uh, this uh, function depends on what this uh, argument is far away from x is same as saying that it depends on all derivatives of f at, at that value x. Okay, so, that is basically what typically one means by non-local and in some similar sense this, uh, this n0 is also non-local. Okay, so, uh, so, this is non-local for a similar reason that uh, there is an operator and a square root of the operator and that operator is in that denominator. So, in that sense it is also non-local. So, now uh, you see if q is 0 I choose to not define it using this formula. So, the definition is this. So, now uh, so the question is this is certainly a some kind of a particle hole creation operator because it uh, creates a hole because B q annihilates a boson and therefore, it creates a hole and B dagger 0 and uh, creates a boson, but at the value uh, q equal to 0. So, therefore, it is particle hole creation, uh, but then it is non-local particle hole creation because this D is non-local because of this extra term there. So, you might be wondering why I selected B dagger 0. So, there is a, a specific reason for that because you see uh, for non-interacting bosons the ground state is basically a condensate. So, that means that all the bosons are sitting at Q equal to 0. So, this is in some sense uh, uh, a kind of uh, an operator that takes a boson outside the condensate and leaves a hole behind in the condensate or it does the reverse. If there is uh, some bosons sitting outside the condensate and a large number of bosons in the condensate, it brings it back to the condensate. So, it is kind of, uh, so D actually does that, D, D uh, brings back a boson from outside the condensate into the condensate, whereas D dagger does the reverse, it takes a boson from the condensate and uh, puts it outside the condensate. So, so, these are basically particle hole creation operator for bosons in, in the situation where you have a condensate. So, now uh, mathematically, so you do not have to necessarily interpret that way, you can just say this is the mathematical definition. Now, the important question is, uh, there are two important questions. First is, you see the B satisfy simple commutation rule, they are after all uh, exact bosons, namely that B commutator with other B's is 0, B commutator with B dagger is Kronecker delta. So, now the question is what about the D's? So, the D commutator, uh, is it D's are also bosons? Yeah, that is the important question. So, you will see that because I have defined it this way, it, it so happens that the D's are also exact bosons. So, in fact, that is a very fascinating. Uh, so, just like B's are exact bosons, these D's are exact bosons only if so long as I include this very funny non-local factor. If I do not have that non-local factor, then D's are not exact bosons. So, that is the important thing. So, now that is one facet that is very important uh, aspect. So, which is ma what makes is likely to make it useful. It is only if your particle hole creation operators are also bosons. See, the reason is because you see your Hamiltonian will be uh, writable as something involving B dagger B plus if you have interacting interaction between bosons, it will have B dagger B, B dagger B, something, something, some something into B dagger B plus something else into B dagger B, B dagger B. So, this would correspond to the two body interactions between bosons. Now, the point is that you see if you are successful in uh, rewriting these, uh, these both I mean these products of uh, particles in terms of, so these are products of bosons, but then this peculiar combination of products of bosons are also bosons, but they are individual annihilation operators. So, these are products of creation annihilation operators, but they are peculiar non-local combinations but then the end product is still a annihilation of a, of a different boson. So, now if you are successful in doing that, then you can suspect that there is some sense in which 
this Hamiltonian will then become basically uh, quadratic plus perhaps a linear term. So, there will be a quadratic term in fact, this would not be linear for reasons I will tell you later this will also be quadratic. Okay, so, so bottom line is that this whole thing will become quadratic in the new bosons even though uh, your original uh, Hamiltonian was quartic in the original bosons. So, this is basically the uh, fundamental property which makes uh, this so called bosonization uh, technique useful. So, you might think that why am I calling this bosonization everything is still a boson. Bosonization means you are turning something that is not a boson into a boson, but the B's were bosons, the D's are bosons. So, there is nothing mean. So, in other words in this context bosonization means turning one kind of bosons into other kinds of bosons. But later on you will find that uh, the more interesting version of bosonization is to turn objects which are fermions into bosons which is really remarkable. Uh, but I would not be fully successful in doing that I will be success I will be uh, well let, let me get there. But bottom line is that uh, for bosons it is an exact thing that this non-local correspondence uh, immediately gives you a canonical bosons yeah. So, now the question is that what should I do with this why is this useful see this is useful so long as I am able to express some general operator b k b k dash in terms of uh, these d's. So, if I am able to write in other words if I am able to invert this I want to invert. So, if I can invert this then write b k b k dagger uh, in terms of these d's then uh, I am likely to be able to use it because after all my Hamiltonians are of this sort. So, uh, so in fact it so happens that you can do that and this is how you do that. So, I invite you to verify this all you have to do is insert this formula here and show that it is an identity. So, you have b dagger k plus q by 2 b k minus q by 2 is uh, an exact result this is an exact result. See it is uh, if both are 0 it is n 0 if one of them is 0 it is either d or uh, d dagger but if none of them are 0 yeah. So, if one of them is 0 anyway by definition this is supposed to be 0. So, if one of them is 0 it is either d or d dagger and if none of the k plus q by 2 or k minus q if none of them are 0 then this is same as this these two are same which is quite amazing. So, this is something you have to uh, verify on your own and uh, n 0 can also just like n 0 can be written like this it can also be written like this. So, the n 0 uh, original definition involved the b's, but you can also write the n 0 in terms of the d's where n is the total number of particles which is fixed. So, n 0 is the number of bosons in the condensate yeah. So, so in other words any Hamiltonian which involve involves the b's because they are always necessarily going to involve b dagger b sort of thing. So, you can always insert this formula into your Hamiltonian and then uh, start studying it. So, in fact, uh, you see there is a some sense in which so, if, if you have a situation where your condensate is very large. So, if your n 0 is very large you can suspect that this is the dominant term this is the next dominant term this is the sub dominant term. So, you might as well uh, decide to work with this. In fact, if you approximate b dagger b with this you are in essentially doing what is called Bogolyubov's theory. So, which is well known in solid state physics. So, that is effectively saying that the condensate is very large. So, you are looking at small excitation. So, small number of particles can uh, get uh, excited from the condensate and a small number can which are already excited can return to the condensate. So, there can be small fluctuations of the condensate. So, if ignoring this will amount to uh, studying Bogolyubov's theory. So, Bogolyubov's theory basically uh, allows you to uh, so, this becomes exactly solvable in that limit because n 0 is very large you can treat it as a number 
uh, so its fluctuations are small, so you ignore its fluctuations and uh, this theory becomes exactly solvable and uh, because the B, uh, remember the B's were exact bosons, but the D's are also exact bosons. So, and the, uh, your Hamilton is purely quadratic in the D's. So, it is exactly solvable. So, the Bogolyubov's uh, theory gives you a, so basically it gives you all the eigenvalues of the, of the excitation and so on. So, you will get the Bogolyubov spectrum and so on. So, that is the interesting reason why we decide to rewrite uh, properties of interacting quantum particles not in terms of creation and annihilation of particles themselves, but rather in terms of creation and annihilation of particle whole pairs because that is how the uh, Hamiltonian in all the condensed matter problems manifest themselves they manifest themselves as particle whole pair operators. So, you, so you do not have many situations where the number of particles in your system is not conserved a priori. So, yeah, so it is basically a Hamiltonian conserves the number of particles most of the time. So, the question is how would you deal with this? So, now the question is uh, how would you generalize this to fermions? You see the or the B's are all bosons. So, if they are bosons, it is really is fortunate that you can rewrite this in terms of uh, other operators which are also bosons, which is quite a remarkable accident because it does not, it need not have been that way. In fact, the reason why it is that way is because this is something like a, a unitary operator. So, in fact, you can show that this, this behaves like a unitary operator. So, this is just a unitary operator. So, so it is just some unitary operator times B is D. So, that is clearly, so whatever commutation rule B obeys, D also obeys. So, uh, bottom line is that uh, this is very, uh, you know, it is uh, like suspiciously easy and uh, it did not have to be that way that there is no reason why D's should have been exact bosons. And uh, what is even more surprising is that if you invert this corresponding the pondens, there is no reason why B dagger B should be writable in this rather simple way. So, there is no reason why there should not have been well, uh, you know infinitely many terms after this plus dot 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 but there is not, this is all there is to it. So, you see, so these are the two surprising aspects of this sort of transformation. So, on the one hand, these are exact bosons, but then uh, it did not have to be that way. And then secondly, when you invert this correspondence and write the number conserving products, you get uh, just a finite number of terms. Okay, so, the next important thing that, uh, well, uh, I think I have not done it here, but it is worth pointing out and that is, is there a possibility you can write uh, just the B itself in terms of the D's. So, is there a way I can write B itself? So, fortunately, the answer is yes, because you see, uh, remember, I, you can always write uh, B0 as uh, e raised to minus x 0 times square root of n 0. See where uh, x 0 n 0 is i. So, basically uh, x 0 is canonically conjugate to n 0. So, this is called density phase transformation. So, in fact, you can convince yourself that uh, this basically because of this. So, if you use this idea and you insert it uh, here. So, you insert it here. So, you can write uh, this uh, this operator as, uh, so you see this is nothing but uh, B 0 1 by square root of N 0 is e raised to minus i x naught. So, if I take dagger on both sides you get, uh, if I take dagger on both sides this becomes 1 by square root of n 0 b 0 dagger equals e raise to plus i x 0. So, now if I insert this here, so if I insert it there, 
So, this becomes e raise to plus i x 0 times b q. So, therefore, you see uh, it is nice to know that b q itself can be written as e raise to minus i x naught into d q by 2 into q I mean of bracket q. So, you see b q just the annihilation operator itself has a formula in terms of the d's provided you also invoke this one. So, this is the canonical conjugate to your uh, and the number of bosons in the condensate. So, it is nice to know you can do things like this, but uh, the really important useful um, version of this is when the B's that I am talking about here are not bosons, but the original particles of fermions, but I still want the number conserving products to be actually bosons. So, you might be wondering why that is because after all you see if B's are bosons then D being boson is not that surprising. But what I am trying to imply is that if B's are fermions, D's are still some version of D's which I am going to define later, they will still be bosons or I want them to be bosons. But the question is why do I expect such a eventuality or a possibility? Why, why do I think that number conserving products of fermions should have uh, anything to do with bosons? So, the reason is given in this sentence here. Uh, one starts off with the observation that the object B dagger B with different momentum levels is the only one that enters in the Hamiltonian of number conserving systems. Furthermore, it satisfies closed commutation rules. So, regardless of whether the B's are bosons or fermions, the number conserving products of these uh, operators obey closed commutation rules among other members of its kind. One is therefore led to look for formulas for these objects in terms of other bosons, not see the because they obey closed commutation rules. So, the number conserving products of uh, two operators you see, you see whether regardless of whether the original underlying particles of bosons or fermions, the number conserving products of those objects will obey closed commutation rules. Even though the original annihilation operators may have obeyed anti commutation rules with their creation and annihilation uh, counterparts. So, even though they may have obeyed anti commutation or commutation, the number conserving products will obey commutation rules among other members of its kind with other members of its kind. So, therefore, we are led to look for formulas for these objects in terms of other bosons because they obey commutation rules rather than anti commutation rules. So, that is the reason that is the motivation for uh, looking for a fermionic version of this correspondence which is incredibly hard to deduce, well this is already hard if you think about it, it is I mean once I explain it to you it does not seem that hard, but it took me a long time to figure this out. And uh, the point is that uh, the fermionic version uh, I figured out after a gap of several decades maybe uh, yeah, almost a decade from here to took me that long. So, uh, maybe even yeah, more than a decade. And in fact, it took me a long time to even understand that uh, uh, a rigorous uh, fermionic analog of this might be needed, because I was able to circumvent. Uh, in fact, as I have explained in this paper and my later papers that a lot of physics can be extracted even by circumventing these technical issues. And uh, so, that kind of put the mathematically rigorous analysis of these transformations on the back burner. So, for a long time I, I did not do it. So, it is only when referees of various journals insisted that I started thinking about it and then finally did it and it is part of uh, 
chapter 12 of my of the textbook that you are using right now so it's already there in print namely it's there in my textbook in chapter 12 so that's the fermionic version of whatever i've just described which is only to be found in this paper that i wrote in 1997 as part of my phd thesis next i'm going to explain to you the fermionic version of whatever i have explained and then i'll explain to you why that is so incredibly interesting and important so and that would conclude this uh, moocs course on uh, dynamics of classical and quantum fields so this is the most advanced uh, topic in this course and uh, it has a kind of a research flavor so a lot of uh, the uh, topics i mean the lot of questions that i'm going to pose in the very last lecture which is the next one will have uh, uh, no easy answers and and i strongly urge those of you who want to specialize in quantum field theory and many body theory and so on to give it a serious thought and see if you can contribute to the research literature by thinking about those issues Okay I'm going to stop now uh, so let's meet for the final lecture mm -hmm.